Oh my goodness, it's a German ACOG. Well, not really. Thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, where we're taking a look at this looks like but isn't a German World War I ACOG. This is a Carl Zeiss 2.5 power Glass Vizier 16. And this is one of the most interesting, most unusual uh, German sniper optics used during World War I. Now, this is distinct, obviously distinct, from the standard sort of sniper scopes that were used on Mausers during World War I. Germany, of course, had a pretty robust sniper program during that war, and almost all of what they used were, uh, well, were really a variety, an array of pretty typical 3 and 4 power telescopic sights that mounted right over the action. There was some difference between, say, the Prussians and the Bavarians over whether it was better to have the scope mounted centrally on the bore, or offset it to the side to allow for stripper clip loading. But all that aside, that's like the normal sniper stuff. What we have here today is really the unusual one. And that is because this was designed not to be a permanent converted sniper rifle, but rather to have an optical setup that could be basically just clipped onto any rifle and taken out in the field with minimal extra training or problems. Now, it doesn't appear to have actually really worked out that well, but we'll get to that in a minute. First, let's take a look at how this actually works, because you'll often find pictures of these, but nobody really talks about, like, what is inside there? Is this actually some time-traveling ACOG? So this thing is called a bifocal scope, or a bifocal optic. And there's good reason for it. But in order to actually show you much, well, it's hard to do with the thing attached to the rifle. Handily, this is a quick detach sort of optic. So let me show you first how this attaches, then we'll pull it off and we can easily take a look at the insides. We have two little spring mounted plates right here that snap into, so you can see these two spring out like that. Those snap into these two little recesses on the sides of the, uh, the rear sight on the Mauser. Squeeze that together, pop it off, and boom, it's off. Now we can take a look at this thing from the front and really show you what's actually going on there. So what you see there is a line in the glass, and that's not a crack. That is actually be, that, that's the bifocal part of the bifocal description of this optic. You have a two and a half power magnifying lens in the bottom, and just a normal lens up top. This is actually, as best I can tell, the exact same system that is used for uh, the seal sight, which is a, a neat little sort of unusual sight that's still available today. And they're, they're under a hundred bucks today, and they use this exact same mechanism. So you've got a little magnified bit at the bottom. You're actually going to look through it from here, a little eye, protective eye cup, which really isn't necessary because it's because, well, this is a long eye relief scope. In fact, it's a no eye relief scope. You can use this from any distance because the, the, the straight through image of your sight isn't actually magnified. All you're magnifying on this is actually your front sight. So as used by the Germans, this scope, the system, included a clip-on front sight here. You can see on the side there, it's also got this Carl Zeiss Jena uh, mark. And then that really big white triangle is your replacement front sight. And that's what you're actually looking at through, well, through the the bifocal magnification of the scope. And you're going to line that up just like you would line up a see-all sight today. So the line here, just above the point of the front sight, that line is pretty clearly visible, and that's the top of the bifocal magnifying lens. What you want to do is line up your target so it's right at the tip of that triangle, which is magnified two and a half times. Um, if you go too low, like this, the tip of the triangle disappears. That's no good. And if you go too high, like this, now uh, your, your target's going to be above the triangle. Basically, what you want to do is line up the top of the bifocal lens with the point of the triangle and your target, like that. I apologize for the quality of that footage. Uh, unfortunately, while this is mechanically intact, the lenses themselves are awfully heavily fogged up. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm happy we were able to get any sort of usable, visible sight picture through it. But uh, if you set this up and try and actually take a sight picture on the rifle, it's pretty difficult to do just because of all the haze. 
can also show you the markings there, Carl Zeiss Jenna. This one's numbered 4807. Um, that's a pretty high serial number for this thing. If that implies that there were actually at least 5,000 of these made, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, they do have it marked 2.5 power. And then there's a little bit of a close-up of the, the mounting system, which is pretty clever. The idea was you could just drop this onto any rear sight. Now, that does require the rear sights to be relatively uh, made, made to a relatively high level of accuracy. That was an issue that Germany would run into with the ZF-41 when they were manufacturing rear sight blocks on Car 98Ks. No one anticipated that the sides of the rear sight block would become you know, optics mounting points and would have to be tolerance for that. Because you know, normally, just like the side here, it doesn't matter if that's you know, in or out of spec by a fairly wide margin, because it doesn't do anything, as long as this can slide along it easily. So what they actually did um, for a period in the manufacture of these uh, rear sights, you'll mark, see them marked GLV. And that is basically it's a, a mark noting that this rear sight was made to a higher standard, a higher tolerance, um, and is acceptable for attaching one of these 2.5 power scopes to. So if you start looking at Mauser 98s, especially 1916 and 1917 production ones, uh, you will, at some point, you'll start noticing some of those uh, specially made high tolerance rear sights. I should also point out there are two little flat springs right there that allow this to kind of wiggle on its mount. And that's going to allow, uh, allow the scope to kind of find its own resting point. There we go. So that's nice and tight down in there. Snug on the other side as well. And there's our Glass Vizier 16 bifocal optic ready to go again. Unfortunately, I don't have any good production numbers or timelines for these optics. As far as I can tell, that information is lost. None of the good reference books have it. And frankly, you're lucky to find a reference book that even talks about this in any depth more than just having one snapshot of it. So I think we can pretty safely assume that it didn't work out as well as had been hoped, just by the fact that these things are so incredibly rare today. Um, they're far rarer than standard pattern German sniper scopes. And you would think if this was something that worked out well, they would have made more of them, and more of them would have survived to this day. But this is not the case. I can also see, just from the mechanics, this kind of has a lot in common with some of the early British sniping sight attempts, things like the Galilean scopes, where they would put one lens on the rear sight and one lens on the front sight and give you this like really narrow field of view but magnified optical setup that's another really unusual and interesting world war 1 uh, sniping system that just didn't work out well and didn't last very long and i would lump this uh, the two and a half power zeiss in with that so uh, it remains, of course, a really cool piece of military history here, because as I said, they're very rare to find, especially ones that also have the appropriate front sight on there. That thing, you know, it snaps on, snaps off, it'd be pretty easy to lose, and most of them are gone. Usually when you see pictures of these rifles, they don't actually have that on there. So uh, this is, of course, coming up for sale here at Rock Island, so if you've been really wanting one of these, perhaps if you're a collector of sniper rifle uh, type systems, well, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to ForgottenWeapons.com. From my site, Forgotten Weapons, you can then click over to Rock Island's catalog page on this rifle. Take a look at their pictures, their description, their price estimate, all that sort of good stuff. Thanks for watching.